this module, we will basically talk about uh, how a public key cryptography actually works as compared to a private key cryptography and also look at uh, how is the authentication service uh, typically uh, implemented and what kind of uh, different options that you have for implementing the authentication service in a typical uh, application. So, in a symmetric key cryptography as we saw in the previous module, uh, the sender and the receiver uh, basically know the same shared secret key uh, which will be used for both encryption and decryption. So, the sender will basically use the, the shared uh, symmetric key for encrypting, it will generate the cipher text and the receiver will re use the same shared uh, symmetric key for decrypting in the decryption algorithm and then generate back the original plain text. But here the question that actually comes in is here is that how do I really have the sender and the receiver agree in the first place what key to use for doing this encryption and decryption, right. So, we cannot obviously say that I will first transmit the key in the plain text format. Uh, so, that the receiver knows what key I am going to make use of, because if we do it in that manner, it is equally possible that our intruder that we saw in the previous module has been listening on that particular exchange also through which the intruder will come to know what is the key that is being used and then it basically does not prevent him, does, there is nothing that prevents him from using the same key to get back the original plain text when he is completely unauthorized to do so, right. So, this becomes a challenge here where it is a question on how the sender and the receiver here will actually uh, agree on what key to be made use of for doing the, the symmetric key uh, encryption and decryption on the sender and the receiver side respectively. So, with this uh, uh, challenge uh, we uh, had the public key cryptography introduced where it was actually taken in a very uh, uh, innovative approach where the sender and the receiver do not share the same secret key and I have something called as a public key and I have something called as a private key, right. So, the public key is the encryption key that is actually known for everybody, right. So, if I am actually a valid user on the system, I have a public key and a private key and I basically announce a public key to everybody in the system in the network. So, if anybody has to send data to me, they have to use my public key, uh, encrypt the data and then send it to me. Whereas, the private key that I uh, actually have, I do not announce it to everybody and it is considered to be a secret, right. So, uh, in, in, in normal parlance when we say it is a secret, we generally have a practice that uh, if somebody is a close friend, we basically go ahead and tell uh, to him that, okay, this is a secret, do not tell everybody and uh, uh, this is a message that I want you to be considering it as a secret, right. But in the network security world, the definition of secret here is that it is not even known to the second person at all, right. So, with that definition of a secret, the private key is called as a secret key. Now, what does this mean? So, this private key that I am supposed to be having for me should not be known to any other user or any other node in the network and it should be known only to me. Right? So, we have now two keys, one which is the public key which is to be used for encryption uh, purposes. So, whenever somebody has data to send to me, they will use my public key and then encrypt and then send it to me and then I have something called as a private key which I do not announce to anybody else and I which I keep it to myself right? Uh, as a secret which will be typically used for decryption. Uh, decryption of the cipher text that is actually coming in from the sender to me, right. So, that is the key that I will use for decrypting the cipher text and regenerate back the original plain text, right. Now, if you see this here, so the encryption algorithm is basically taking the plain text message and will use the public key of the receiver. So, Bob is a receiver here. So, I am going to use the public key of the receiver, get the plain text message the encryption algorithm is going to do some magic, generate the cipher text and the cipher text will be sent on the wire. On the receiver side, if Bob receives that cipher text message, Bob will basically apply his private key right, on the encryption algorithm and then he will generate the original plain text message back. Right? Now, so the cipher text is basically 
application of Bob's public key on the plain text message and how is the plain text message generated back? On this cipher text that has come on the wire, Bob basically applies his private key, right. So, magically the original plain text that had actually got introduced by the sender okay, as an input to the encryption algorithm on the sending side gets regenerated back. right? Now, how is this possible? So, Bob basically in this particular example has a private key and a public key pair right? and this public key and private key pair is actually generated from a very large random number, random prime number and the public key and the private key has to be generated from the same random prime number based on certain mathematical principles. So, as long as these two keys the private key and the public key are generated from the same random large prime number and number 2 they satisfy this mathematical principles that are required to be satisfied. It is guaranteed that even if the encryption algorithm has used this public key part of that pair, right? the decryption algorithm can use the corresponding private key of that pair and then still even then I will be able to get back the original plain text message successfully. right? So, that is how the public key cryptography actually works. right? On the other hand for uh, some of the other purposes, we will also be actually reversing this property of uh, the RSA, right? wherein I basically use the public key first followed by the private key to get the message and at other side I might also use the private key first followed by the public key. So, in, in both cases we will always find that the original message is what is getting generated. right? So, whether I apply the public key first and then apply the private key or I apply the private key first and then apply the public key, in both cases I will be able to get back the original message. So, this is a very, very important property of the RSA algorithm which uh, we will find very useful for implementing some of the other network security principles uh, later on that we will be seeing. So, coming to authentication, so as we uh, discussed in the previous module, with the authentication what we essentially want to do here is that I want to make sure that the other person is really the person who he or she is claiming to be. right? So, in this particular example, Bob wants to know that allies should prove our identity to him. right? So, what could happen is very simply allies can say I am allies. Right? So, that could be a message that is actually coming in saying I am allies to Bob and what could be a failure scenario here to provide a very foolproof authentication mechanism is that. Now, Trudy can also get into the network and then say I am allies. Right? So, there is no way by this simple mechanism uh, of authentication uh, for Bob to really know that actually Trudy is really sending the message trying to act as if she is somebody else, right? she as if she is allies. Right? So, this basically has this basic problem of not even providing the most simple authentication mechanism. So, what can I do as a next evolution in this is that allies can basically build a packet in which allies IP address will be there followed by the message that I am allies right? and then send it to Bob. Now, if Bob has basically by any, any chance a list of mappings of IP addresses to users, then Bob can really verify whether the IP address that is actually come is basically allies IP address in this message or somebody else's IP address and thereby sort of confirm right? that it was indeed allies and not anybody else. Right? So, what could be a failure scenario here? Trudy can also create a packet by spoofing allies IP addresses and then putting the message as I am allies and then send it to Bob. Right? So, if for some time allies is not in the network, Trudy will be able to do this because if both of them are on the network at the same time and allies is Trudy is generating this kind of a packet, there is a possibility that it, the network might detect it as a duplicate uh, IP address from a different source and then act on it. But if there is a situation where for example, uh, allies is actually not logged in right now or not up in the network, 
and in kind of a scenario in that kind of a scenario Trudy is basically generating this packet and then sending it out. Uh, Bob will not have any means to verify that it was really Trudy who was actually trying to spoof Ali's IP address and then adding the message I am Ali's and sending it to him. So, this also gets a problem where our required expectation of authentication is actually not met, right. So, what I can really do as a next step is that along with the IP address and the message, I can add a password, Ali's password to sort of prove to Bob that ok. So, uh, this is the password that I am using which again Bob can verify with something which is internally which he has an internal database with him in some format to verify whether the IP address and the password and the message is actually mapping on to whatever he knows as Ali's IP address and the password locally at his side and then he confirms back to Ali saying that ok, I accept you now we can actually start the exchange data exchange right. So, with the response message like it like this in this format right. So, now what is the failure scenario here? If Trudy has actually been doing a plain eavesdropping of the message exchange between allies and Bob. So, as we discussed eavesdropping is the first type of activity that the person uh, the intruder will actually try to do just to get an idea of what kind of nodes are there, what kind of users are there, what is the pattern of the exchange that is actually happening and all that. So, if Trudy has actually been doing this role of eavesdropping on the network trying to identify the packet flow from different people to uh, different people, they can the hacker can actually basically record this particular sequence and then do a playback right. So, it is like our normal uh, audio video kind of a uh, uh, record and playback where if you put a CD uh, we can just do a playback of whatever uh, song or whatever sequence that we want to hear at any point in time. Likewise, Trudy can decide at a particular point in time to play back the recorded text that she had eavesdropped originally right and at that time Bob can really think that ok, it is right now allies who has again come back on the network and start the communication, but actually it would have been Trudy who is actually posing as an allies by taking her IP address, by taking her password and also very easily putting the message as I am allies right. So, which all this information has actually been captured uh, by uh, Trudy as an attacker by just doing a plain eavesdropping of the original messages that has been going between allies and Bob previously right some time back. So, this is basically what is referred to as a record and a playback attack right. So, I could do an encrypted password for allies and then allies can send it out uh, which is again not preventing the, the scenario of a record and playback. I could actually uh, record the entire sequence and then Trudy can as an attacker uh, when uh, she had eavesdropped got the original message and then played it back to Bob at a later point in time including the encrypted password which will again lead Bob to believe that ok, this is basically the original allies uh, and all the uh, things are actually matching with what uh, allies should have sent me. So, and thereby uh, uh, Bob will really look at Trudy as an allies and then start communicating with her as if uh, she is allies. So, in the previous slide uh, we actually saw a, a version of the authentication mechanism where we, we found out that there is a possibility of a playback attack uh, happening. So, the, in the next version of the authentication uh, uh, mechanism we will try to see a way or a technique by which we can try to avoid this playback attack. So, how do we try to avoid the playback attack? We basically use something called as a nonce value. Now, definition of a nonce value in network security is something uh, is it is actually a number which can be used and valid only once in a lifetime right. So, in order to prove that the other party allies is live Bob will basically try to send a value nonce value r to allies right. Now, what should actually happen here is that with the help of a shared private key uh, a secret key that Bob and allies is already having allies will be expected to return back this nonce value encrypted with that shared secret key right. So, for example, let us say that uh, allies in this particular case is triggering the conversation with Bob. So, by saying that I am allies 
and now Bob is basically going to be actually sending out the nonce value that has been generated out by him at his side to allies, right. Now, what is actually expected is that by the help of the shared private key uh, which uh, both Bob and allies uh, is actually uh, uh, sharing already, allies will be expected to encrypt that nonce value uh, that has been received from Bob and then send it back to uh, Bob. Now, when Bob is basically re receiving this uh, encrypted value, since the key is available with him also, he can basically make use of the key and decrypt it, decrypt this value, regenerate the nonce value out and verify whether was it the same nonce value that uh, uh, was originally sent by him to allies. Now, if, uh, if it had been subjected to a man in the middle attack, uh, it would be very clear that uh, this k a of b that is a, the shared secret key between Bob and allies would not be available with the person who is actually acting as an intruder now and because of which this particular uh, uh, encryption of the nonce value is going to be failing uh, to result at the Bob side with the original nonce value getting generated out. right? Uh, because uh, the, the key would not be available to the intruder and if he sorts of goes into a brute force mechanism for example and tries to use any key, the original nonce value that Bob had generated is not going to be getting regenerated when Bob tries to decrypt this encrypted nonce value on receipt of the encrypted nonce value back at this side. Right? So, because of which uh, here uh, we actually try to avoid the, the playback attack uh, that was uh, very easily possible in the mechanism and the authentication mechanism that we were talking in the, the previous slide. So, in order to ensure that the problem of the symmetry key being shared earlier between the two parties is also eliminated, instead of using a symmetry key encryption for this uh, encryption of the nonce value, we could actually use a, a public key uh, cryptographic technique where uh, as we discussed, I will basically have the authentication. Uh, the encryption done with the public key of the receiver right? and then he, when he decrypts it with the private key, he will get back the original nonce value hopefully and with that original nonce value, Al Bob is really confirmed that it was actually the, uh, the other party allies who had actually sent, received the original nonce value from him and then has sent the encrypted value back uh, right now. right? So, with this kind of an approach, I will basically be able to have a very secure authentication mechanism wherein the two parties have actually authenticated themselves successfully. Right? Here uh, there is only one level of authentication, but in certain situations both the parties will sort of challenge each other to authenticate themselves one after the other and uh, where there are situations like for example, there is a protocol called CHAP protocol, a challenge uh, access protocol uh, in which uh, there is a version of it called as a mutual CHAP where both sides try to challenge each other and sort of confirm themselves internally that okay, the other party is really the party that it is claiming to be. right? So, in which case I will have the mechanism of authentication done on both sides after which only, only if this mutual authentication is successful, the data transfer will be allowed to actually happen. Thank you. Mm -hmm.